Okay, let me also start by thanking the organizers for this wonderful meeting um, and for inviting me to give a talk. I'm glad to be one of the token speakers on string theory here at Strings 2015. Uh, <laughs> um, so I'm going to describe some work uh, with uh, one of my students, Matthew Dodelson. Uh, we just put out two papers about it recently and are continuing in this direction. Um, this involves trying to understand the role of uh, a classic effect discussed by Susskind some years ago involving uh, string spreading um, and make new applications of it to, well, refine our understanding of it first of all and then make some new applications of it to black hole dynamics. Um, part of the story involves trying to uncover this effect in ordinary flat space string theory amplitudes. So these papers cover some discussion of four and five points and there's a new calculation at six points that I'd like to include for you here. Um, so let me just get going. So the basic question here, as it, far as it comes to horizon physics, both say for black holes and for cosmology, is a very simply stated question, which is what is the leading effect, say in string theory, causing a breakdown of effective field theory at horizons? Now the naive estimate would be that effective field theory is a very good approximation if the curvature in string units is small and the tidal forces are similarly small. Um, however, this is subtle, it's known to be subtle because uh, despite the weak curvature, say, of a large radius Schwarzschild black hole, uh, over a long time evolution involving trajectories falling into the black hole horizon, even though the curvature is weak, the trajectories can develop a large energy, in a sense that I'll make clear very shortly on the next slide. Um, and that makes uh, for a subtle question, um, especially, or as far as I know, particularly in string theory, uh, because of this string spreading effect that I'm going to review. Um, and uh, this suggests a string theoretic modification of GR that's uh, interesting to um, pursue into these uh, applications. Um, so let me explain that first comment about the large energy that develops. So uh, up here I've just written the Schwarzschild black hole uh, in Kruskal coordinates. Um, and here's the picture. So think about sending two uh, massive strings uh, into the black hole from outside with you know, some fixed modest energy and mass as measured in the outside Schwarzschild coordinates. Um, as they fall in, the trajectories are, you know, trivial to compute, and um, in this Kruskal coordinatization, uh, you can easily translate the trajectories uh, and see what they're doing at the horizon. And um, if these trajectories, say, are sent in in exactly the same way, just time translated in the Schwarzschild time t, then um, the uh, strings reach the near horizon Rindler flat space region with a relative boost that grows exponentially with delta t. Um, delta t over 2rs is the relative rapidity. Um, and they also fall through the horizon separated along that x plus direction by a commensurate amount. So the situation is that when these strings reach the near horizon region of a black hole, uh, they have, can develop a, an enormous center of mass energy, that is one that grows exponentially in the time translation uh, that you set up, uh, but at the same time they're falling through quite si similarly displaced along the, uh, this light cone Kruskal direction. Um, okay, so, so again that's, that's the, the the slogan, there's a huge energy in the near horizon region, but there's a separation along this x plus direction. So uh, this uh, separation uh, brings in the, the question that I want to focus on in this talk, which is that of, of so-called string spreading, um, which is a simple physical ca set of calculations and picture introduced by Susskind in the 90s. And uh, as we'll see, it was really solidified uh, in a certain sense by uh, a cal calculation within this paper of Brouwer et al. from 2006. So here's the basic setup. Uh, think about strings in light cone gauge. So uh, there's a light cone time that is fixed to p minus tau. And then given that, there's a constraint that determines x plus in terms of the transverse coordinates. And it's a, 
um, hopefully familiar uh, linear to relation between a li something linear in X plus and something quadratic in X perp. Um, basically, the oscillators of X plus are the Verisoro modes of the X perp sector. So that allows you to compute the variance of the embedding coordinates of the string in both the transverse directions and the longitudinal X plus direction. Um, this, in each case, it's, the answer is infinity, um, but it's realized as a sum over the modes of the string. So here, let's just take for simplicity a, a single string ground state. It doesn't matter if you excite it by a small amount above the ground state. Uh, the, this uh, mode sum on the right-hand side is dominated by the highest uh, modes that, that are relevant. So here, um, in both these expressions, I've cut it off by hand at some maximum no mode number, and we'll come to the, the physics of that shortly. Uh, if you do that, then the, the transverse uh, modes variance goes logarithmically with that maximum mode number, plus a correction that is of order one over n max. And uh, the uh, longitudinal one is quadratically divergent in n max. Um, so the idea of, of Lenny originally was that, you know, this is just a true fact, um, and that uh, there is an appropriate n max to introduce, which has to do with the light cone time resolution of a detector of this, of, of this effect. Um, before I get to that, which I will in the next slide, um, let me address something that confuses many people when you first hear about this, and us as well when we started thinking, uh, which is, you know, what picks out these, these different directions? Um, um, so far I just had this string, single string sitting there, and there's nothing really just in that that tells, tells us uh, any preferred choice of longitudinal versus transverse. But as soon as you have a detector of this effect in the game, which we will, um, then there is a direction that is picked out, which is the direction of relative motion of this string whose spreading we're interested in and a putative detector of that effect. So um, the direction of relative motion uh, is, is the longitudinal direction. And uh, given this BPST paper's calculation that I'll get to shortly, uh, we can be more precise than that. There's a, perf there's a preferred longitudinal notion of longitudinal, which is um, realized by the so-called brick wall frame, where the momentum transfer is shared equally among the four in and outcoming states. Um, but it's you know, basically the direction of relative motion. This respects all the symmetries. Um, OK, so that's what we mean by uh, longitudinal versus transverse. Um, okay, now let's come back to this idea of how, you know, what is required for a detector to, to be sensitive to this effect. So the, the original idea of, of Susskin was that, indeed, it was the resolution in this light cone time, which goes like 1 over p plus of, of the putative detector. Um, and if you use the, you know, mode expansion, the relation between uh, the light cone variables and tau on the world sheet uh, in the light cone gauge that I reviewed, uh, on an earlier slide, um, then that would give you an estimate for this uh, n max uh, that would be s times alpha prime. Um, I put a less than or equal to here uh, instead of, of making that identification for two reasons. One is some, some simple intuition that we had in this project uh, somewhat early on, which is, turns out to be realized by this uh, explicit calculation that I will get to shortly. Um, and uh, the idea is the following. So th this is the sort of maximal resolution you could have um, given a P plus. That would be your, your optimal light cone time resolution. But it seems clear that you know, if, you have, if you consider different detectors with the same delta X minus but different trajectories across the spreading source string, uh, you know, a detector that goes along it should have a better chance of detecting than, than otherwise. So a, a trajectory that's more time-like should do worse. Um, and in fact, if conservatively you insist that the detector moves a, a, a light cone uh, distance of order, your detectable spreading delta x plus in the time delta x minus, then uh, you would predict that the n max, and hence the detectability of the effect, is degraded re re relative to this optimal estimate by a factor of uh, basically alpha prime t if, if the mass is zero. 
Um, so there'd be this denominator of p plus squared plus m squared instead of 1 over alpha prime. OK. Um, and that, this physical idea of the light cone spreading from the vacuum fluctuation of the embedding core into the string, combined with the detectability of it uh, determined by this light cone time resolution, in fact, degraded by the factor that I just motivated, it comes out in a nice explicit calculation of uh, the four-point Reggie string amplitude in light cone gauge. Um, which was reviewed and kind of elaborated on in this BPST paper. So uh, it's just a, a standard light cone calculation of the four-point string amplitude um, with a certain ordering, um, which uh, you know, puts in the Gaussian wave function for the incoming and outgoing strings and the leading uh, interaction that is relevant in the Reggie limit. And uh, when they do this, and the mass is zero in this case, um, a combination of the Gaussian wave function and this interaction produces a, a sum within the calculation that explicitly realizes the cutoff, uh, which on the earlier slide I had just put in by hand. So uh, within this calculation appears uh, this, this denominator, which as you can see uh, shuts off the effect automatically at some finite n max. And that n max, if you put everything together in this calculation, which includes a saddle point uh, integral over the interaction, light cone interaction time t, which is a gross mende like thing, and I'll come back to something related to that shortly, uh, you reproduce the predicted n max, including the, the way I keep saying it degrades by this factor of t um, explicitly. Okay, so. Uh, you know, it just seems like the right physics. Um, so to sum up, uh, vacuum fluctuations of string embedding coordinates x um, can interact with a sufficiently sensitive detector, and one can make uh, quantitative estimates for, for what that entails. Um, and, you know, just for the record, it's not unfamiliar that vacuum fluctuations of scalar fields are detectable. Of course, that's a, a regular possibility in physics. Um, so, as you can imagine, just kind of geometrically, it's easier to determine transverse geometries than longitudinal and scattering problems. So there's kind of been a suspicion in the community, kind of lore, that somehow the transverse effect could be real and then longitudinal is, is just an artifact. And, you know, that's what we want to work on addressing. Uh, but just for the record, again, there are plenty of constrained variables we know and love in physics where the one that is just constrained in terms of others is perfectly physical. And probably maybe an analog of what we're talking about here would be, say, the expansion of the universe, which is related by the Hamiltonian constraint to, to other degrees of free freedom. And on a string world sheet, that's like the, ex the expansion of the world sheet universe. So, um, you know, it, however, it's certainly worthwhile to try and understand how this effect uh, might appear in gauge invariant calculations of S matrix amplitudes. Okay, so uh, our approach to this has been as follows. To work with the classic uh, tree-level string amplitudes, it turns out particularly interesting at five and six points, um, although we'll do a warm-up with four points. And our approach is to convolve these amplitudes with wave packets to somewhat localize them in position space um, and keep track of the phases of these amplitudes, which when convolved with the wave packets determine the uh, peak central trajectories of these wave packets. Um, and, uh, you know, just you can imagine this is a schematic uh, expression for such a wave packet analysis uh, where the, the phase of the amplitude will affect the the peak in the um, distribution of position space variables like the impact parameter and the just generally the trajectory through space time. Um, we'll work in a Reggie regime, and I'll explain exactly what we mean by that uh, shortly. Um, and our wave packets have to be kind of broad in position space, but they'll be narrow enough to justify focusing on the leading term in a Reggie limit. Um, and so we'll do something that is kind of naive, but seems to fit the facts in a non-trivial way, which is we'll take these trajectories for the asymptotic states, we'll trace them back into the middle of the process, 
to try and understand what the geometric uh, picture of, of the process might be. And um, even though that seems very naive, we'll find a, no, a quite non-trivial check of that geometry. The trajectories will meet, uh, which they didn't have to do. There are old-fashioned string solutions when, when the uh, amplitude is one of those that has a, a S-channel production that fit that, that geometry. And um, it involves certain incoming strings turning directly into outgoing strings, which can be tested one order higher by looking for whether when you add a, radi a low energy radiation leg, whether that bremsstrahlung long radiation comes off that turning point, and uh, that is what happens. So um, we, we then pursue this to higher orders and see what it, what it would say. Um, okay, so there's some subtleties with these wave packets. There's, uh, we explained this in the paper. There's, you know, they have a finite width. Um, basically, in order for the wave packet to allow us to fix the angle of the scattering sufficiently well. Uh, there's, a, there's a limit on the width of the wave packet. Um, and it, it allows us to localize the trajectories in, in the needed way for, uh, for example, focusing on the Reggie limit. Um, however, it is true that there are, that these are broad enough that other impact parameters than these peak ones I'm talking about contribute to the amplitude. Um, okay. However, there's a, there's a clear physical interpretation of these peak trajectories, which is that they are the most probable among this class of wave packets centered on those values. Okay, so um, how am I doing on time? Oh, I shouldn't have encouraged that. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, I want to start actually with the latest thing, um, partly because people have heard this before, um, and, and that's something we're really excited about now, which is, so I'm going to go back to four and five points momentarily, but it's worth saying first that uh, a setup in flat space X matrix uh, amplitudes that is actually close to the black hole problem that I outlined earlier uh, is, is set up the, the following way, and this was started in discussions with Don Meroff, where um, you use some auxiliary hard scattering process to produce a string that's labeled one prime here which um, has the kinematics to be a good detector of some third incoming string C um, in a way that A and B are not. Um, and, and this has the feature that it you know, produces the detector at a finite time in such a way that it never just direct, its central trajectory never directly crossed that of the string who's spreading it's uh, meant to detect. And so um, this may give us a test of whether they can interact nonetheless due to the longitudinal extent. So the question would be, even if we send C in early by an amount uh, predicted by, for this longitudinal spreading, can, can they non nonetheless interact? Um, so in, in field theory, a similar, you could, you know, first it's good to set such a thing up in field theory and remind oneself how it goes. And if you do the same thing in field theory, well, it's basically a step function. You know, if you send the thing in up here, if you, if you sit on the pole of this one prime and you send uh, C in up here, then anywhere up here, it, it can interact in the same way with, with one prime. Um, and then conversely, if you send it in earlier than at T equals zero in this picture, it cannot. And indeed, you find a step function in field theory. Now, so you can do the same thing in string theory. Oh, and I should say, you can also work off the pole, and that's useful in string theory because the poles are so closely spaced that it's not as easy to isolate a pole as it is in field theory. Um, and you can, you, there's a similar off-shell statement. Um, so in string theory, you, you can do the six-point calculation here in the right regime that I've set up, where uh, one subprocess is hard scattering and the other is Reggie. And you find um, it's, it, it's actually a fun calculation, and it simplifies pretty nicely to a factor that's this hard scattering, a phase that's calculable, um, and a Reggie part that corresponds to uh, the interaction of interest between C and one prime in this picture. Um, and we, we are finding, and it's, you know, this is preliminary, it's work in progress, but we've double, actually triple checked this, and we're getting a shift uh, backward by the expected amount. Um, now, um, okay, so as compared to field theory at least, uh, what's happening in string theory is shifted earlier by an amount that is as expected in this longitudinal spreading story. 
Um, it's also deformed in various ways by the rest of the stringy stuff in the amplitude. Um, so this is at least uh, passes a test. Uh, uh, it's a necessary condition for longitudinal spreading to be real. Um, on the other hand, the hard scattering factor is kind of fuzzy. It's spread out by large scales. And so we have to be careful about whether that, that affects the interpretation. Um, but at least this necessary condition has been interestingly satisfied. Um, OK, so let me go back to four and five points. And our approach, again, is those wave packets. But to, just to slow down a bit, we, we take as given the transverse spreading. Um, it's something that's um, you know, well established. You can see it explicitly from the impact parameter transform in forward scattering. Um, and it's, again, well established by this full light cone gauge calculation of the scattering amplitude. Um, so you know, that leads to a density of string transversely that is this, uh, this Gaussian suppressed thing. And it's important, just to belabor this, that physically this is a real density. Um, no extra imaginary parts in it. Um, OK, so uh, let's warm up with four points. Um, this is one of the orderings in the standard Veneziano amplitude, which is a product of gamma functions. And you can transform things so that the arguments of the gamma functions are all positive uh, at the expense of this sinusoidal factor, which has a leading phase of e to the minus i pi t um, you know, times a sum over additional phases. Um, which are not particularly suppressed in amplitude in the weak coupling regime we want to work in. Um, however, they are, correspond to long time delays that are longer than our wave packets. Um, and they describe a series of oscillations of the string after it joins before it splits. Um, you know, this is something we read about in a paper of Cyberg, Susskind, and Tumas. It's probably a standard thing. Um, so, but because our wave packets are narrow enough, uh, we can ignore the higher terms and focus, if we like, on this first term, and that's what we'll do. Um, we put in the wave packets. This is a linear combination of on-shell vertex operators. And convolving, you get peak trajectories. So there's a peak impact parameter for this ordering that is non-zero and a, a certain excuse me, time delay. Um, um, OK, so, so we compute those trajectories. And as I said, um, you know, I have to summarize this pretty quickly, but we take those trajectories and trace them back. Um, this picture is exaggerated because we're actually working at small angle. But uh, you, you, you can trace the trajectories back into the middle of the process. And um, it has this form where, for example, the incoming string A bends into string 1 um, in a way that's uh, consistent with the trajectory. So uh, again, it's a per maybe naive a priori to imagine that they directly bend in this way. Um, however, it's a non-trivial, this, this naive picture is uh, non-trivially checked by the fact that the, uh, in the wave packet analysis, these trajectories do meet in that way in all dimensions, uh, which did not have to be the case. Um, and similarly for B and 3, I don't think this is an unconventional view of Reggie scattering, the two hadrons just kind of bend uh, slightly, exchanging momentum. Um, and another test of that is to upgrade to five points where uh, radiation comes out peaked at the turning point, or from the turning point, I should say. So again, if that picture were too naive, why would, why would that happen? Um, so we take it, oh, and, and additionally, um, there are this is a, a process in which there's a, an imaginary part that corresponds to string production. And there's a classic string solution, a kind of generalization of these old yo-yo solutions, which are determined by the rotation of the endpoints that uh, fits the geometry non-trivially. So there's an input that's the, um, there's a simple geometry problem that includes the uh, oscillation time determined by the uh, legs of this rhombus, and um, you can, derive from that the, the peak impact parameter. And, and there's one more output than input in that. So, um, uh, so you know, a priori, this is a naive picture, but it fits the facts in a way that seems non-trivial. Non -trivial. And you know, then in the, at four points, the question becomes, OK, when do these, if, if, if the picture is this picture, 
uh, you want to ask when do, the, when do the strings join to produce this yo-yo solution? Um, and uh, for there to be a longitudinal effect, one would just need to exclude an instantaneous, purely transverse, you know, immediate joining and splitting. Um, we think, indeed, that that possibility is hard to make sense of for somewhat subtle and detailed reasons, which I probably don't, I definitely don't have time for. Um, however, you know, okay, this is something that I think everyone who looks at this gets, gets a little exercised about, so I would recommend you look at that if you're interested. One thing I do want to say is that if you take um, this, so this, I mentioned this BPST calculation has a saddle point, which is basically a gross mende type calculation. And if you take the scale in that as uh, indicative of the real time scales in the problem, it produces, um, an, uh, so it, it gives you a saddle point, inter an integral that you can do by saddle point for the, uh, the light comb time of the process, delta x minus. Um, and just kinematically, given that, uh, the uh, particle A travels along this longitudinal x plus a distance um, of order E alpha prime, uh, which is the scale of uh, this putative longitudinal spreading. Um, so, you know, we aren't confident that one can take the complex saddle point and immediately deduce a geometry from it, but it would fit. Um, okay, so at five points, we play the same game. Um, there's, a, there's a four point amplitude that has zero peak impact parameter and peak time delays or advances. And we ask, you know, how does that get shifted when we add a fifth leg? And okay, there's a, there's a Venetiano-like amplitude and the naive traceback looks like this. And it has this interesting feature that um, given the meaning of the trajectories, which again is non-trivially tested in the same way as we had at four points, um, it indicates an early interaction um, having been shifted in that direction by the addition of the fifth point. Um, so the picture is, is this, uh, and I hope I've made at least clear what the, what the procedure was. So for horizon physics, long story short, assuming that the light cone spreading is, is a physical thing, and I think there's now substantial evidence for that from what I've tried to explain, you get an interesting breakdown of effective field theory. It's not universal. It's not true that any late infaller sees it, but there's a range of, of parameters of the trajectories for which it, it is detected, which um, satisfy the conditions for breakdown of effective field theory. It's not some stupid you know, direct interaction. Um, and it's, it's again generated by the, by the way the weak curvature of the black hole generates uh, a large relative boost, even you know, just over the long time scales of the trajectories. Um, so it's, you know, it's, so okay, so let me just make a few quick remarks. Uh, this is, just to be clear, this is, a ca this is causal physics. There's nothing acausal about it. This, this, these modes are just always spread out. Um, but it's just non-local. Um, uh, it's interesting that that factor of T alpha prime that I kept emphasizing that degraded the effect relative to the initial estimates um, makes this actually consistent with ADS-CFT and with gross mende in a way that wouldn't have been true otherwise. Um, it makes it also a smaller effect, but at least uh, it's interesting that things fit together in that way. Um, uh, it's sets in as soon as you get into this near horizon region, which is a bit outside the horizon. So it's interesting to try and apply this to the AMPS paradox and maybe even to the real world. Um, you know, even though this may sound like a kind of wild thing, it's perfectly consistent, it's perfectly viable, it's perfectly consistent with <laughs> observational constraints um, uh, for, you know, reasons I could explain if I had more time, which I do not. Um, and, you know, to me it's really interesting to generally contemplate what really is the leading modification of general relativity that is due to string, to, to string theory, um, and could that apply to uh, things like, you know, detectable effects near horizons in, in the real world. Um, so, okay, cosmology is fine. These are my final remarks, so let me just stop there. Thank you. So, questions?
If you have a shell of dust forming this black hole, uh, how do you get that any, any of these effects to be important? Sorry, I can't hear If you have a shell of dust forming a black hole, a very low density shell of dust forming a horizon, how can you get any of these effects to come in uh, after the horizon is formed? Well, if you're th we're thinking of the early string as a proxy for the matter that formed the black hole when it comes to trying to apply this to the classic thought experimental problems in black holes. If you're asking about it, you know, accretion disks in real black no, holes. No, 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 just a shell of, you know, if you just make some shell of yeah. dust, which is, you know, yeah. very large and, you know, it forms a black hole when the dust particles are very widely separated from each other, for example, how do you get this effect to be large? So the, the, the large effect comes from, a tr you know, a late infaller, so that dust formed the thing early, and some later infaller is, has this huge relative boost, com you know, relative to those early uh, infalling. <laughs> But then it's still, it's, I mean, if said that since everything is causal, it will keep on evolving and it, it, it will just fall. I mean, it will be, it it is will be big, is, but then it will just go to the horizon. It's, it's causal. Just think of the string. The string is always just spread out. Just like scalar fields in real life are always fluctuating. Um, and it's just that the, the trajectory makes the late infaller become a good detector of that early spreading. It's just, it's, there's nothing acausal about it. It is very non-local, but there's nothing acausal about it. If, if that was your question, which I'm not sure if it was. Um. So m maybe you're hinting at this here, but if you tried to write down a low energy effective action after integrating out the string modes, what are the kinds of terms you would have to write down to account for these non-localities? Uh, yeah, that I, 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 that's, a, that's a good question. I don't um, think about it in those terms. I think about it more in the world sheet terms. Um. Well, the point is that here, what this is saying, if you know, what this is saying is that uh, that that low energy effective action breaks down sooner than you thought, right? Um, so that's you know, it, it, it's more UV sensitive than than you would naively think. Um, so, so the I think the right sorry, I think the right answer to your question is, you know, if this is indeed physical, um, then. Uh, it's, it's just not a good approximation to try and boil it down to uh, you know, an effective field theory description for this obvious reason here that this involves you know, the high oscillator modes of the string. So, so those aren't, you know, those just let's aren't say the late well accounted for by a, by a finite number of low energy fields. But let's say the late infaller wasn't very late, but just falling a little after the collapsing shell of matter. In that situation, there should be some some way in which one could see these non-local effects while they're still suppressed. Uh, so you might, it, it, I agree, it would be interesting to to look at it as it sets in. Um, certainly, I agree with that. It's, but you know, it's. Um, uh, I was focusing here on the regime which is dominated by the large and max, you know, modes, and the point is that those go beyond GR. So, yeah. Hi, you are. Hi. Uh, I see why the way you're setting it up, it's not a causal or whatever, but yeah, non-local. Yeah. But I'm just worried that maybe the non-locality might turn into a violation of uh, causality because the degree of non-locality seems to be something tied to a relative uh, momentum. So just to ask you, uh -huh. suppose you had two small strings, which are made small because their individual momenta in their own rest frames, etc., are small. And now they come and interact. I have to think. Yeah, yeah, so that's that's the kind of interact. Yes, yes. And then, since their relative mo energies and moment are big, they see a degree of non-locality. Can you not that then turn that into a product coming out earlier than would have been allowed? It's no? not. It's Is not it earlier clear? than would have been allowed. You know, given that they are extended, right? They're, that's why it's uh, non-local, but not a causal, is because. I mean, it's, it's, of course, the string theory is not as dumb as some kind of rigid, you know, object. But, you know, if you take a rigid object and scatter it, you know, it can bounce back sooner than the center <laughs> of it does. I mean, there's nothing a that's, yeah. So there's really nothing uh, a causal about this. Um, okay. if, if I understood the question. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? <coughs> well, if not, let's thank our speaker again. So this